Well, hello, and welcome to Unity in the Wild session. Uh, so my name is uh, Valentin Simonov. I'm a field engineer uh, in, uh, at Unity Technologies. Uh, here's my email if you have any questions about uh, the session or just uh, want to say hello, feel free to write. Um, and today, I invited uh, five teams to show their great projects built with Unity, of course. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, are kind of limited in time, and we will not have uh, questions uh, after each session, but uh, I asked all the guys to stick around after the, uh, uh, at the end of the session, so just hold all your, que all your questions to the end. And uh, the first project is uh, Tripad by Alex Krasi. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us today, but uh, here's his uh, email. If you're interested in this project, if you want to work with him or like, build something like uh, he did, uh, feel free to email. So more about the project. Um, this is a Novation Launchpad Mini. Uh, it has a lot of buttons. Uh, and um, I personally have this uh, condition called uh, uh, shiny button syndrome, as when I see a, a device with a lot of buttons, I want to get it. I don't know why. I have a lot of them uh, in my closet, and I'm not using them. But this thing is uh, generally used by musicians, DJs, and um, like visual artists. Uh, and it's interfaced with the uh, outside world using this uh, really old format called MIDI. It's actually older than me but it's uh, still actively used. And uh, there's a very simple wrapper for uh, Unity, which you can use. It's uh, made by my colleague uh, from uh, Unity Japan, uh, K0, and here's uh, the URL. This project uses this library, by the way. But uh, nowadays, if you are interested, into, uh, if you're interested in uh, interfacing with uh, this kind of devices, you'd better use uh, uh, another format, another protocol called OSC, Open Sound Control. And there's a bunch of uh, libraries available for Unity, uh, like uh, my small library, this OSC Sharp. And there's uh, this great asset store package and another open source library, Unity OSC. And on top of uh, OSC, there are a few other protocols built. Uh, for example, Tuyo for like, sending multi-touch data to, via network to different devices. Uh, and, uh, for example, there's uh, like also my little library, Tuyo Sharp, which, uh, which I use in a TouchScript library I built. So, uh, well, if you look closely at uh, the device, you can kind of imagine a really low DPI 8x8 display, more touch display. So if you set up it like this, it will be like a 3D touch display, like 8 by 8 by 8. And actually, if you look at it from this angle, it kind of resembles a Unity logo itself. Um, and with this kind of setup, you can have uh, different multiplayer games. So uh, Alex built uh, this setup for, uh, for events. You can see there's uh, like a small computer down there, and three of these uh, launch pads connected together, and there are speakers for music. And with this setup, you can have uh, different kinds of gameplay. So this one is like three players. Uh, they, by pressing buttons on the side, they can create these lines which go through uh, the cube. And you see this ball jumping around. Uh, and the goal for each player is by pressing these uh, buttons and creating lines uh, to keep the ball on their side of the cube as long as possible. So who, who keeps the ball longer wins. And you see that the lines, they are kind of uh, like they help you, but they also um, kind of mess with the other person's side. So it's a really interesting competitive game. And this is just one of the like, gameplays possible with this device, as you can imagine. Um, and this thing is built with Unity. Uh, of course, you, you can ask uh, why use Unity for such a 
weird thing because uh, there's no there's no like, display. You don't need 3D for that. Well, actually, the cube is 3D, but uh, like, we have like three sides. So if we take a look at the Unity project, uh, it looks like this. So um, we basically have uh, the workflow like this, like a 3D simulation. Uh, it uses using Unity physics uh, and renders two textures. You can see them uh, on the sides of the cube. And these textures are converted to media data and sent to the devices. So this is actually really, really clever. And Unity, for me, Unity is growing not like only a 3D game development tool. It's, it's more like a general purpose tool uh, if you know it, you can interface different devices uh, to Unity using uh, because MIDI, OSC, and uh, other protocols. And you can create these weird-looking devices with very strange gameplays. So if you have any ideas like for like, other various games for this device, or you want to, uh, or you have, uh, like, like me, many such Mm, devices uh, lying around uh, you are not using, and now you can probably figure out how you would use them. Uh, once again, you can write to Alex and ask him for advice or um, like work with him. Uh, and this is my part. And next, I want to invite uh, Basil, and he will show us uh, their awesome robots, which is built in Unity. Perfect. So, hello everyone. So I'm Basil. Uh, I'm an R&D uh, R&D engineer uh, in Bluefield Robotics, which build robots. Um, so Bluefield Robotics is uh, is a spin-off of uh, um, an association uh, in Paris uh, named CRIF. Uh, which makes robots uh, for for more than 15 years. Uh, but what about now in robotics? Actually, there is a, a need in robotics uh, that you can uh, see on the graph, and uh, past technology can, uh, can't afford that. And now, present technology can do something with. Uh, Robotic domestic robots, uh, but uh, the main thing is that near future promises us to to have a lot of application in domestic robots. So is this a time to build a robot we can which can fit near future technologies, and we can have uh, application uh, in the present. Okay. Oh. So this is a robot. So he's here. So his name is Buddy. And this is a uh, whole thought about uh, what, uh, what a robot in a house should be. So this is a robot for a lot of people, actually. It's mainly for the family. But it's also for classroom, for elderly, it's for autistic uh, children, it's for company, uh, and it's also for developers to build their own application. So this is mainly for family, and so it can do a lot of things. There is native application that we developed uh, uh, in our office, uh, like uh, remember, um, remind your important tasks, take shots. Uh, Connect people together, watch your, ho you watch your house, assist you, entertain you. And since it is um, an open platform to develop, uh, there is a lot of applications that can be uh, made with developers. So here is, um, uh, here is uh, the robotic platform. So it's a robot. So it has motors. So you can control the motors. Yeah, it has uh, f four degrees of freedom, uh, and a lot of sensors, as a thermal camera, as a speak um, it's not a sensors, uh, some distance sensors, some ground sensors, 
Um, it has also some speakers, microphone, and it is an Android tablet inside, which makes the, the mind of the robot. Uh, now I will show you what we uh, all thought about the SDK we will provide with this robot. So the main thing is to have a uh, body, body's API, uh, which allow you to communicate with the hardware, so get the feedback from the sensors, um, and uh, and control the motors. Uh, but you you will be able to uh, to use some blocks we will develop as uh, face recognition, uh, navigation, voice recognition, and a lot more. But you can also develop your own blocks and uh, share it to the store as asset store because it's working on Unity. So you can use asset store to share your blocks and then build your own application. And then uh, since it is an Android tablet, you can deploy your application on the Android market so, or other existing stores, actually. So we use Unity for Buddy. But that was, uh, that was a challenge because uh, it is very, it, it, there is a lo uh, huge distance uh, from classic robotic uh, platform and community. So we, have to, uh, we had to, to implement uh, a lot of function which is already implemented on other platforms. And, uh, and so it is not the same community. Uh, in Unity, uh, we had to implement the hardware, the hardware uh, communication to have the sensors and other things like this. But we, already, we have already done that, of course. Uh, and there is still a gap between robotics and, uh, and video games, which is the same gap between reality and, uh, and, virtu uh, and virtual world. But the good thing here is that this is our job in Blue Frog Robotics to, uh, to go through this gap. And uh, we've done that. Uh, so why, what, why we use Unity? Actually, we want to have a robot which everyone can build application on it, and not only the robotician. Uh, and Unity is a really good pl uh, platform for us because it's very easy to start with. Uh, there is a huge community, so a lot of people already know the interface, and not only the robotician. Um, there, is a, there is a store to, to, um, to share uh, code, to share everything. Uh, Unity integrates graphics, of course, uh, but uh, we are roboticians, so we, don't, uh, we are not graphists. So it's cool to have uh, something uh, like this. Uh, it integrates a 3D engine, uh, so it's, uh, it's quite good to to use this 3D engine to make easily um, a simulator of the robot, so you don't have to have uh, the robot to program on the robot. Uh, so yeah, and uh, and it's not uh, it's quite we can uh, we can control the robot as we can control a, a non-player uh, character in a, in a game, so uh, it can fit with this. So yeah, I wanted to show you a little part of the SDK, but uh, I will maybe not have the time. Uh, so we are uh, at this point, actually. We just, uh, we just finished our Indiegogo campaign right now. And so we will release uh, the SDK and simulator in December. And at the end of the year, uh, you will be able to, uh, to buy a buddy uh, in markets everywhere in the world. So I will try to show you a little part of the SDK. Um, so here's a uh, a code I've made uh, before coming here. Um, this is a simple one, actually. Uh, so the main thing here is to make the robot move when I press a button. And uh, he will stop when he sees something in front of him. 
so here uh, we can see in the updates that uh, we get the uh, feedback from the sensors here, um, just here. And uh, when he sees something uh, in front of him, so less than uh, 50 centimeters, it will just stop. So this is ap this application currently working on the robot. So yeah, if I press this button, it, it will go. Oh, okay, it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's it. Well. But it, I saw it working, so um, are, are you going to be uh, still here at the expo area? Yeah, yeah. yeah so you can come later and uh, play with the robot. I just had one question, like, can you upgrade hardware, put lasers on it or something? <laughs> Actually, you can upgrade laser, <laughs> but uh, we didn't build this kind of thing because this is not the purpose of the robot. <laughs> Okay. But uh, yeah, you can plug arms actually, and uh, you you can plug like uh, uh, Pico projectors arms uh, on the shoulder. Uh, you have a docking station, so you can charge by himself. You have a lot of things like this for the robot. Mm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have uh, Sam and Andrew. I'm just. Uh, Quickly find their laptop here. Oh, probably this one. This one, right? Yep. Mm hmm. That's oh. embarrassing. Phew. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Levine. I'm the Serious Games Capability Lead for our team, which is Digital Interactive at Booz Allen Hamilton. And I am Andrew Mashar, and I lead our virtual reality and augmented reality parts of the team. Um, so real fast, I wanted to talk about us and what we do, uh, and then I'll get to showing off our product, which is, um, yeah. So Digital Interactive is a 100-ish uh, sized team of devs, artists, designers, sound engineers, a lot of print guys. Um, our aim is to do everything digital that our clients can come to us and ask for. So we have like a mocap studio and a green screen uh, sound room. Um, we do web, mobile, standalone applications. We do a lot of iPad apps and um, VR, AR, anything our clients could hopefully ask us. Uh, our parent company is Booz Allen Hamilton, a 25,000 person premier consulting and contracting firm based in Virginia. Um, and they do everything from like nuclear engineering to what we do, which is, you know, fancy, beautiful visualizations and stuff. Um, we were here last year. Uh, my boss is right there. Quick shout out. Um, we showed off two quick products, a um, VR bloodstream demo, like a VR experience where you were a nanobot going through the bloodstream, and a sweet unnamed um, GIS plugin that we're trying to sell if anyone's interested, um, in which generates real world terrain in real time um, in Unity, so you can you know, throw balls off of it and stuff, um, which we hope will have useful applications for our clients in uh, the GIS space. Am I missing anything? Nope. All right. Real fast, shout out. This is the serious games lead. I want to say we do make games. We're very proud of that. But this is the non-games talk. So really fast. Um, I was very happy to. I'm very uh, honored, super happy to have worked with both these projects. The one on the left is Peer Pressure, the um, U.S. Navy's only app and game. Uh, it is a behavior change game, which is, uh, encourages sailors to have responsible drinking habits. Yep, it's always funny. Um, the one on the right is a sweet AR and um, AR suite. Uh, it is sweet, and also it is a suite for a museum, uh, which included a game that I got to work on, a sort of tactical World War II game um, for a DoD museum in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And so to give you an idea of the range of projects we work on, um, we do everything from what Sam was talking about to this MC Mobile, which is a 3D data visualization platform that we use to take our clients' data and allow them to filter it down to visualize what's going on in their workforce now and how they can plan for the future. Uh, in addition to that, we also do prototypes with bleeding edge technology. So for example, here we have a project where we were taking a um, a 3D laser scan of an environment, um, which you could do with, for example, a Project Tango, 
and bringing it into Unity for our clients and allowing them to put in all, uh, any kinds of annotations and notes that they want. So you could do this for something like a crime scene investigation so you don't disturb the crime scene, and you can build your reports automatically from these notes that they generate. Now today what we want to talk about is our 3D hospital demo. So this was a marketing prototype we built to show off our capabilities in modeling and simulation. This is a very short project with a very short time span. In fact, and, and as a result of that, we ended up relying heavily on Asset Store uh, and TurboSquid models and Mixamo. Um, and so all of the artwork you see here, with the exception of the hospital floor plan itself, came from those sources. Um, so we based the floor plan itself off of a real hospital in New Jersey. Um, and to, I want to talk about the features that we have in here. So uh, to start, we have uh, two different views. So we have the overhead view, so you can see what's going on in general, and then the more immersive first person view. We have Oculus and GamePad support, which I'll get to in a second. And to give you an idea of what's going on um, at a high level with the simulation, we have the um, Agent-based model, which is how everyone's running around. This is kind of the standard um, what's going on in a hospital at any given time with the doctors, nurses, and patients. And then the deeper part of the model is infectious disease and how it spreads. And Sam's going to get into uh, the mechanics of how those work in a minute. Um, but first, so one of the cool things about this project with a short time scale, we actually didn't plan to put in Oculus support. But because Unity is really good at it, and our team has a lot of experience with Oculus support, we were able to put it in and found it actually gave a, a better immersion. And it also, um, people really liked it. So for the marketing purposes, um, people really thought it helped. And it just really kept it in people's minds. And they got really a little bit more excited based on just the fact that we had Oculus support. Yeah. Um, so All Sam, do right. you want to get into the yeah. specifics? Yep. I really wanted to re re reiterate that just throwing the Oculus stuff in there, it was just, it's an, it's, it triples the value of the product. Um, and again, this isn't a consumer app. This is something we made basically to show off internally and to clients to try to get more work. Um, so it's not a thing that we're trying to sell to anyone. It's just to show off that we can do this stuff, um, which is why it could look better. A lot of the meat and maybe 80% of the dev time was just in making this really sweet model um, and making the behaviors realistic and integrating a fancy disease library. Um, I missed something? Whatever. All right, so, right, I was going to talk about this fancy model we made. Um, so ESI is an emergency severity index. Uh, patients are randomly just generated at random times, and they come in with varying levels of problems. Uh, ESI 1 is like you're about to die. It's like you cardiac arrest. Um, ESI 5 is, I think, you cut your finger, which actually I've done recently. Um, and patients basically uh, act appropriately. Um, some of them directly get treatment. A doctor or nurse pick them up immediately. Um, but most of them have to wait in line forever and are triaged appropriately, just like in real hospitals. If you are more sick, you are dealt with first. And if you're not, you wait for a long time. Um, like that guy. That guy. Um, yes, doctors and nurses, again, behave appropriately. They do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, at least blood work surgery and an MRI machine. They all carry out. They see patients. They go on breaks. They've got multiple rotations. and like schedule rotations and physical rotations. Um, and they wash their hands, which is super important for the disease sim, which I'll talk about next. Um, and then there's janitors and admin staff. And the event model is pretty simple. Um, basically, it's all ge geographic with just simple box colliders. So um, when a patient enters a treatment room, the nurse, is, the nurse queue is notified, which I believe is how it works in real life. And then the first available nurse comes over when she can. He or she can. All right, next. Um, figured just why not, since we're trying to show that we have the sophisticated civil, um, simulation, I figured I should show the state list. And I think these screenshots are okay. Shows the pathing and the doctors and nurses in their states. So I'll show it real fast. Woo! Right. Um, the other impressive part of this is a disease model, which we had to use a um, mod modeling and sim library that our client requested on a Tomcat server. So this is um, not entirely built in Unity. Uh, locally, there is a Tomcat server running every 100 milliseconds. Unity pings it uh, via REST calls. It sends the actor in, uh, status and information. It gets back basically the state of the disease every, every 10 times a second. Um, it is a very cool disease model. Uh, diseases spread. There's multiple disease types. They spread based on infectivity type and uh, the time spent. And like there's an inverse square distance calculation. And everything can get infected. 
like light, lights, TVs, that's why there's all these dots on the map that like, aren't pointing anywhere. I have to stop pointing down there. Um, lamps, beds, TVs, everything's affected. On the lower right corner, you can see like a waiting room. It's just super, super green. Um, and disease is removed by the staff and uh, doctors washing their hands. When Valentin um, sent out the email about this, he said this is going to be our zombie apocalypse simulator, which basically is what happens if you um, turn off the hand washing. Everyone just gets super sick and it gets really gross. Is that it? All right. All right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the restrictions that we had on this project. So again, we had this very tight budget uh, and schedule, so we, we produced this in a limited amount of time. But we were able to uh, use this, this requested uh, mod sim library to uh, create this very realistic simula simulation that allows our client, or any client, to see what's going on in the hospital, be able to act upon um, and hopefully lower the incidence of these diseases. Um, and again, because of these restrictions, we actually ran out of time to do some of the extra UI work we wanted to do, specifically metrics. Um, and so we had to make a decision. And what ended up happening was we, instead of being able to hook up the metrics for this, we just took an asset store asset that was a video of some metrics. And this actually paid off really well because, again, this was kind of a we show people what we want to have in here, and just the visual was enough for them to understand what we were getting at and sort of fill in the blank of what they wanted to see in the future and what kind of metrics they could put in. Yeah. Um, I also want to note, I'm very proud. So all the UI and the screenshots we showed before was basically just we made that over the last two days here at Unite because now we have free time. And uh, yeah, sorry if we, I was programming during any of your talks. <laughs> All right. So um, for the last bit, I just wanted to talk about uh, kind of what we learned as a result of this project um, with the short time scale and things like that. Uh, so really use the asset store, Mixamo and TurboSquid to get your project to a state where you can focus on, on what you want. So for us, this was getting the art in here so that we could have things moving around so that we could focus on the modeling and simulation because the, the artwork uh, was not our focus. Now, if it is your focus, you can grab scripts and things off the uh, asset store in order to get you to that state that you want. Um, and second of all, we went with this pastel no te texture aesthetic for a number of reasons, and it ended up working out really well. Um, and I would highly recommend this for any kind of prototypes that you do. Um, it, it, so we didn't even put in the most important part. Like, if you're using models from different sources, that's the main reason we like went textureless because they can look. They're different artists, right? It can look completely different. Um, yeah. So it's a really useful way to use a bunch of different stuff without your ass artists. Yeah, exactly. And to the combine them into one visual right. style that's very simple um, and allows you to see the differences between the things you're looking at. Um, you get fast performance, and it's a lot faster to develop. Um, so really, that's all we have. If you want to talk about any of these prototypes afterwards, um, we'd love to talk to you. And thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. I just have a one. Well, OK. One I just question. have one question. Uh, can you tell us a few words about this uh, disease library? Like, how does it work, and where it gets data? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I did not you know, implement okay. this library. So um, there's not a disease yeah. library. It's, it's the. Uh, the modeling and simulation library was for the, the back-end server, but we feed the disease information from a JSON file that we actually have locally that you're able to tweak the disease parameters. And so the parameters for the diseases were things like um, the type of disease, and then you can tweak um, how infectious it is and um, how easy it is to infect a given item, so whether that item is static, a chair or whatever, uh, or a human. So the that part of it was stuff that we researched and were able to put in, so it's tweakable in the model. And all I remember is that uh, the random number generator is, uh, uses a Mersenne twister algorithm, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of randomness, a few different distributions, but the exact library, I, I cannot say I recall. No. All right, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. But awkward, yeah. yeah. Well, the next one is uh, Vinny, and welcome him on stage. I uh, just forgot which computer is his. So I'm sitting there, and uh, I see this creepy eyes here. So just not to confuse anyone, just do this. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a little tough to have to follow up robots and zombies. I'm just really glad that Valentin wasn't showing off some ninjas or pirates, and I would be totally screwed. Um, so my name is Vinny Da Silva. Uh, I am going to be talking about virtual reality, but not like what you're thinking. I mean, uh, you guys have had plenty of virtual reality talks 
throughout Unite. So I'm not going to go too much into that. I'm going to go into a lot of some of the hardware stuff that's beyond the actual headsets. Um, so let's go, uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, just before I keep, go I, I keep going, uh, I may speak a little fast, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, one of them is Valentin promised to shoot me if I uh, go over time. Now, I don't want to get shot today. And the second reason is I'm Latino and I have a tendency to speak a little bit fast. So uh, I will try to slow down. But if you're in a video, you guys can slow down the video. If you're here, just keep, keep up. All right, so uh, I am, I said before, Vinny Silva, uh, software engineer. I work with an awesome company called Awesome Interactive. And uh, the general idea is that the junction of ideas and execution, art, technology, you'll find us building cool stuff. OK, so before I go too deep into it, I just want to give you a quick overview of what we're talking about. And I want to start at this photo here. So this is the, um, the footprint of our activation. Um, and uh, what you'll first see is that there's a big uh, central array in the middle of the screen. Um, and that is where we see a map overview of a maze. So the game that we're talking about here is a maze. And then we have televisions for, for two players. So this is a two-player game. And then uh, each, pl each player has an Oculus. We have a, a webcam. And I'll go, in go into the, those details a little bit later. And then the big thing that's probably new to a lot of you guys is the WizDish. So this is a locomotion platform. And uh, you guys probably have heard of the Vertrix. And I think those guys are here. Um, there's this WizDish. It's another product. At the time when we were making this, uh, this project, uh, that is what we had to work with. Um, so we were a little bit limited there. You're going to speak about uh, dev kits, right? Okay. So, and in the end, this is this is what the users get. So, it's a footprint. It's an activation. It's going to be at a live event somewhere, like a sporting event or a festival, a parade, or something like that. And in the end, the, the user goes to this experience. This is what they get. All right. On the left hand side, you see the picture, the third person view of the the player in the game, and on the right hand side, you see the first person view of the actual game itself. And I'll kind of go into details of how we capture all that and how we ultimately send that as an email to, to the, to the uh, consumer. OK, so uh, the other thing I want to mention is kind of important is that so the, this footprint is sort of deployed on site. There's two trailers touring the country, going all sorts of the directions. Uh, if you're not from Massachusetts, you may even stumble onto them. Uh, I know that the end client is actually not based out of Mass. Um, and I think we already kind of went over the fact it's a two-player experience. We got a camera. And the only other point I want to make is that all the digital stuff, the VR, all that stuff was provided by Awesome. And then all of the, uh, the trailers and all that stuff, the staffing is all done by, team, by our partner at Team Epic. Uh, so quickly, I think we kind of talked a little bit about this. Uh, Oculus Rift, WizDish, webcam, int web webcam integration, and I'll talk a little bit about hardware in the road, because my guess is that a lot of you guys like set a computer somewhere and never freaking move it. Um, so I just want to give you guys some tips if you guys are going to be moving that stuff around. OK, so like I mentioned before, all of you guys know the checkbox, the magic checkbox that integrates uh, VR into Unity. So I'm not going to really talk about that. But I do want to talk about, and specifically with the Rift, because we have wires to deal with, is that uh, everybody says, never, ever, ever extend the cord. But we are dealing with a large physical footprint, and we need to. We need to actually extend out the cord. Uh, so everybody says not to. Nobody, they always said, don't cross the beams. But we all know that they cross the beams. So if you do need to extend it, use active HDMI cables and active USB cables. Specifically, we had really good success with Redmere branded cables that we got from Monoprice. There are other brands out there as well. Talk to me if you uh, have any questions about it. But we were successfully able to extend the cable by about 30-ish feet, probably about 10 meters or so if you're not from the US. OK, so the, the magical WizDish. So this is the, the WizDish. Uh, it does have special shoes with uh, porcelain in the bottom. Uh, they call themselves not a treadmill, but a platform. And the reason for that is that it's not an actual treadmill. It is a sort of a, a platform that you, you sort of you, you get on and you essentially shuffle. Um, you can only go one direction. So the idea here is that no matter uh, which way you're physically facing, you're always going one direction. And what you do is use your AH, HMD to determine the direction. So as the person moves, that's the direction they're going to be going. Right? That's your, your west. 
And the interesting thing is that it uses sound to indicate movement. And you're saying to yourself, what? Sound? Indicate movement? What is that? Uh, yeah, it's not what I expected either. Uh, the general idea here is that it uses a 3.5 millimeter jack, uh, which is your standard um, like phone jack. Uh, and it, what you do is you essentially capture the sound coming in. Uh, we use an RMS uh, algorithm just to sort of smooth things out. And we determine whether or not the, what the, whether or not the player is moving or not. Um, when we talked to the WizDish guys, they mentioned that there, there's some possibility we can do if they're running, we can analyze that sound and figure out that they're running and keep moving, keep them moving forward faster. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we just had an on-off state. Um, so if they're running, if they're moving, they're, they're, they're moving in the game. Uh, if they, once they stop, they'll stop in the game. There's no acceleration. And through our playtesting, that seemed to be perfectly fine, no issues. Um, OK. so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a little bit deeper into the wisdom just because that, I think this is a topic that not a lot of people have gone into. Um, so I'm just going to explore this a little bit further. So the, um, so the WizDish is, the original idea is we had to, the plan was to use it as a regular HID interface. So essentially make it work like a joystick, right? Which is uh, how Unity works and how Unity wants to work and it's it, sort of the ideal situations. And we were not able to do that. Uh, we were not able to find a good spot to sort of like uh, inject ourselves in between the input system. Uh, and as you guys have heard, input system here is not that great. Um, so alternatively, 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 we used a MIC input class, which we used to sort of determine whether or not uh, the user was moving forward or not. Uh, some other challenges, right, is we actually had, because we had this mobile setup, we actually had to configure uh, believe eight total uh, gaming machines, and uh, the issue with it is that then you need to configure the microphone volume the same way in all of them. We need to disable any sound effects. Um, it's, it's just kind of tricky, uh, you know. Not totally, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't stop us. I think in hindsight, I probably would have done a PowerShell script that we could have just deployed on all the machines and just have them all configured the same way. Um, there's this frame that. Uh, the wizard comes with. Uh, I didn't show it in the previous picture, but I will in another one. It is not the sturdiest. Um, if you have the opportunity to manufacture something that's made out of metal, something that's really sturdy, something that's really safe, please do so. Um, your, your players will thank you if they happen to fall. Um, and the other odd thing about it is that it does need periodical uh, lubrication. And it also has a tendency of collecting dust. So I just want to keep an eye on that. Um, all our events are, a lot of our events are outdoors. And it could be dusty. It's a little bit icky. So uh, OK, so more in a wizardish. So we do this shuffle. Um, I won't quite explain it on the stage because it's hard to do. But you don't walk. Like, you actually don't lift your feet off the ground. You have to keep both feet on the ground. Uh, it's not natural, but it's, to it's not exactly uh, unnatural either. It's sort of like a, like a forward moving moonwalk. Uh, because the players do move 360, dealing with the cable is a bit of a challenge. We had to uh, work through a couple solutions because there's a tendency that the players will sort of wrap themselves up in it. Um, but the, the good thing about it is it does reduce simulation sickness. People do have the feeling that they're going forward, so it does reduce simulation sickness once they're moving. Uh, HD camera. So, I'm not going to go too much into detail into this either. Uh, it's really straightforward, regular webcam. It works kind of the same way. We picked a specific model because we could just find it at pretty much any Best Buy. So if we needed to replace it, if it broke, it was pretty easy. So we, the, the challenges was the hardware. The challenges was with how do we get the split screen, and then how do we undo the, the barrel distortion? This was pre-5x, so we had to do that ourselves. And then the other thing that we needed to do was start and stop the recording uh, within a game. Uh, so this is actually pretty easy. We just use OBS. Uh, OBS is spectacular. Um, people who stream games have been using it for a long time. Uh, easy peasy. Um, and the other beautiful thing about it is that there is a plugin for OBS that allows us to start and stop remotely. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit. Um, we needed to undo the barrel distortion. We used a uh, plugin from StereoArch, StereoArch called OVR Mirror. Um, and then we just had to tweak a couple of things using 132 APIs just to make sure that the, the screen was maximized. 
Um, okay, so starting to stop recording. So as I mentioned, there um, there's a plugin that allows us to remotely connect to it. Unfortunately, the plugin was originally made only for streaming, not for starting and stop recording. So we changed. We so um, they had a um, the the plugin is open source. So we went in there, we modified it, we republished it. We had to fork it because the guy is no longer accept, um, accepting contributions. But um, the code is there. Anybody who wants to use it, feel free. Uh, any tips? I'll I'll send you away. All right. So hard one on the road. Um, the big thing here is try to use server chassis. We use 4U chassis to keep everything in place. The rack is mounted down into the trailer, so things are pretty sturdy. One really important thing I want to point out there, because we actually got burned by this, is uh, use Loctite. And Loctite is um, like this little blue paint you put on, your, on the screws when you're putting the hardware together. So we built all these machines by hand. If you have ever taken a laptop apart, you have noticed that the little screws have a little bit of blue paint on them. That's Loctite. And then what that does is as the, the machines are moving, vibrating, et cetera, the screws won't come loose on their own. You know, they'll stay there. Uh, we did fry a motherboard because one of the motherboard screws popped out and fried it. And please keep your cables safe. Keep them dry. Um, the ready meal cables can be pretty expensive. Um, so just take care of your, your expensive equipment. And uh, just as a quick little video of what the end result is um, of multiple people playing. This is sort of like a highlight, wi highlight reel of people playing it. People have tons of fun. Um, and you can see here the, the, the frame. Uh, this is the frame that uh, um, the guys at uh, Team Epic built. And it's metal. It's really secure. You see it's not wobbling at all. The frame that came with the WizDish is actually like a PVC piping um, held together by tension. And it's just not that. Um, it's not that sturdy. Please replace it if you can. This is my favorite. People just start smiling, lighting up. I mean, you guys know, whoever dealt with, um, with VR, when people get in there for the first time. Uh, and you do get a real sense of presence because, A, you have objectives that you want to go for. You see them. You want to go for them. So you totally forget about everything else. And uh, that's it. Uh, my name is Vinny. Um, Ozum Interactive is the company that I'm, that I'm working with. And uh, here's the contact info. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, if you have any questions about locomotion platforms, feel free to find me. I love to talk about this stuff. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, sure. Just one question. Yeah. Did you break any equipment on the road? Yeah, so the, we did lose a motherboard on the road because of, uh, like I said before, the. We had, I didn't know of what Loctite even was. I didn't even realize that, you know, I didn't think about the fact that you're, you're transporting this expensive equipment all across the country, and they're going on these trailers that vibrate, and eventually the screws will come loose. So we did lose an expensive motherboard and a CPU, um, but we just found that out, swapped it out, and then we started putting Loctite on everything. Hmm. All right. It's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Well, and the last project for today, uh, I'd like to welcome Alexander. You know, tell us about DevKit. Hello. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Great. So, hello. Uh, I'm going to be talking about filmmaking for virtual reality. Um, and my background is actually as a filmmaker and as a photographer um, with a, a love for futuristic cameras. Um, so I'm with a team called Specular, and we do a lot of work with um, cameras, with 3D sensors, with code, all typically for the purpose of either interactive installations or for documentaries of, of different kinds. Um, and so we, kind of central to our method is we will oftentimes create tools out of a need. And we will start a project or kind of conceive of a creative project that can't be executed with existing tools. And so we will oftentimes create tools internally that enable that for ourselves. And many times, those tools will out, end up out in the world. And so an example of this is a tool called DeathKit, which oops, um, some of the robotics guys will probably actually be familiar with this, this technique. But we were seeing the, the amazing depth maps that were coming out of the first connect. And with a background in, in cinematography, we, um, we were very interested in what 
what would it be like to, to map high quality color information from cinematic cameras onto these depth maps? So we created a toolkit that allows us to calibrate a color camera and a Kinect or any other um, depth sensor so that you have this combined format, which is a hybrid between depth and color. Um, so we started to use it for projects like this. And this is basically in a VFX capacity. So this, for example, is a, it's a film for HBO called, um, it's called Love Child, which um, it's a documentary about a very unfortunate case in South Korea um, dealing with video game addiction. Um, and so I was tasked with the challenge of, of creating visuals that could communicate the ideas behind this film. And I used DepthKit for this case because we were dealing with, um, we wanted to present real seeming human people in virtual spaces. Um, and the fact that we were scanning human beings and putting them in virtual spaces made that possible. <laughs> um, so we find ourselves, so one piece that was missing in doing that sort of Two to more two-dimensional work, sort of VFX workflows, is we weren't able to take advantage of interactivity. And we wanted to integrate these ideas, this passion for documentary work and interactivity. Um, and so we've conceived of this project called Blackout. And in Blackout, you find yourself on the New York City subway, um, surrounded by a group of strangers. And when the lights go out, um, you're gifted with basically the power of telepathy. So you have the ability to sort of look around this dark train, and as you look at people, you start to get a glimpse into their internal worlds. Um, and so we, we did a, thorough, a very thorough set of interviews with a group of people, of 27 different people, strangers in some cases, friends in others, where we asked them a long series of questions about their day-to-day -day experience. Um, and so we built a stage for it. We built a train for it. Um, and this is the... I've been joking that I've, I've developed like a late onset uh, train fascination as a result of this project. But so this is a Type R160 train from, from the New York City's MTA. Um, and this is a Maxwell render, so nobody chased me out of the room. Um, but so we had our stage and we had our, our scenario, but now the question was how to integrate people into this space. Um, and so there are ways to do this, right? We're, we're familiar with them. And, in this emerging world of, of filmmaking for virtual reality, there are a few different approaches. Um, there is the spherical video, video approach, and there is, of course, motion capture. Um, and a few things that were critical to us in making this project were that if it was going to be a documentary, we really needed to capture actual people and put them in this space. And for our purposes, we felt that, that motion capture with even good quality models didn't quite convey what we wanted to convey. And this emerging form of spherical video just didn't quite do it because interactivity was so important to us. And we wanted to give you the power to, to look around and to be able to move around in this space. And of course, when you're filming with this sort of spherical video rig, you're, you're sort of you're locked to that central, that nodal point. Um, so what we did was we took the work we'd been doing with DepKit and expanded it with the intention of using it in virtual reality. Um, and what that involved was taking four of those RGBD camera rigs, so depth and color combinations, and facing them inwards and making a kind of a volumetric capture stage. Um, and we, again, filmed 27 different people, friends and strangers alike, on our stage. Um, and so what it looked like was this. It's a, again, it's a volumetric capture with high quality color information mapped onto it. Um, and so this leads us to Unity, right? We now have these, these captures that we want to use, and we want to integrate them into this virtual world. Um, and so we start to take these figures and put them into this scene. Um, and so this is, this is the result where we are right now. Um, and literally, this is, is like a couple days old. And we're, we're deep in this project right now. And we have these, these figures that admittedly look a little bit strange. And there's a lot of work to do to refine them and to use sort of uh, different filtering techniques, temporal filtering, getting rid of noise, things like that, to improve them. Um, here's, a, here's another one. Um, but the experience that we're having, and it's quite a strange one and very difficult to communicate, is that these things really, really, really work in virtual reality. And just as sort of strange and, and kind of ephemeral as they look on a screen, 
they look very, very native in, in VR. And part of that has to do with the fact that you have this sort of perfect parallax no matter where you are, and, and suddenly you have this freely navigable space with, with actual people. Um, and so true to our methodology, we are creating a tool to enable other people to do this. Um, and we're calling it, you know, currently, DepthKit VR. Um, and what this tool represents is a, a series of steps. And the first one is what I was talking about earlier on this capture stage, where you have to calibrate multiple cameras so that you know empirically where exactly they are in space. And then this very important refinement step, where you're integrating all those streams, you're synchronizing them, you're aligning them, and you're doing the work to, to really refine those streams. And then finally, you're then able to take those into Unity and to use them in your scenes. So things that we're excited about, I'm going to go back. Um, some of the things that we're particularly excited about with this is that uh, it's not heavy data. We're, we're, we're encoding it using traditional like, video codecs, and so we can stream it quite readily. We're also able to, we're using surface shaders, so you can integrate it into the normal sort of lighting models that you have access to in Unity, cast shadows, and eventually relight them. Um, and so what brings us here today is, again, we're, we're kind of from a slightly different community. We're part of the world of documentarians and filmmakers and, and experimental artists of different kinds, where we, this community has sort of discovered these concepts just recently, concepts like um, interactivity, nonlinear stories, these kinds of things, which, of course, the games community has been doing for, for decades, right? And so we're kind of coming to you guys today, and we want to ask you, what would you use material like this for? What would you, how would you actually integrate this in, into to games or, or, honestly, whatever you're doing? So um, I'm going to leave it there. We would love to talk to you. Um, it's myself and my collaborator, James, here in the middle. Um, so feel free to come say hi. So you, you were talking about uh, interactivity. Yeah. Do, do you have a, like, what kind of interactivity do you have in uh, this uh, 3D movie? Yeah, it's interesting. So there, a lot, of, a lot of what this enables is a lot of the interactivity has to do with moving around in space. Uh, and what we're doing now is we're working a lot with sort of triggering different behaviors. And of course, um, of course it's not like a model, like a you know, traditional model where you can animate it in normal ways. So it ends up being more like a video workflow where if you need to really change someone's behavior, you have to sort of branch and pick a different video and that kind of thing. But for us, it's, it's really taking the metaphors of filmmaking which is it's a relatively controlled environment, and giving people the freedom to move around in those spaces. So the analog is kind of like, mm -hmm. it's like immersive theater, maybe actually more than traditional video games that are where you can both move around freely and kind of cause different behaviors with different actors. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, what kind of uh, devices you, you need to for this uh, Kinect and the camera setup? Or? Yeah. So current, I mean, there are, it seems like, Every month, there's like a different sensor being announced. But currently, for us, the kind of state of the art is the Kinect version 2. And of course, we're sort of, there's work that we've done to kind of misuse it as a camera, because it's really not a, a camera. It's, a, it's like an interface. Um, and so things like getting time code really, um, getting frames really consistent and things like that are like the work that we've done to use it as a camera. But again, it's typically the, the Kinect. We also use the Asus, like the prime sensor, the Asus, the Kinect 1. Uh, but we're excited about smaller kind of phone-based cameras and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, speaking about like newer devices, can you uh, uh, say something about like the the most interesting one? Like, oh man, came out? it's it's funny. We're we're like constantly getting excited about both d displays, obviously, and new sensors. Um, and of course, in terms of displays, we are understandably more excited about augmented reality in a lot of cases, more over traditional kind of these sort of helmet head VR type experiences. No offense, sorry. Um, <laughs> but so there, um, I'd say the Intel, the small kind of Intel cameras that are coming out, the depth sensors that are coming out are very exciting. We are- The real sense one, right? Yeah, exactly. And we're, we're excited about, it's, it's sort of a, a shift of paradigms because there's, there's this profound mobility that's possible with these mobile phones. And of course you take, in many cases you take a quality hit, but we're excited about mo like moving many sensors around and, and using maybe more than four, using more, more sensors and that kind of thing. But yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks again. Appreciate it. 
So this is it. Um, but if you have any questions, here are all the guys. Just feel free to ask them. Right? Thanks. Thank <clears throat> you.